Greetings and welcome to an LGR thing. And today's thing is a legend of 90s personal computing hardware, the Gravis Ultrasound. Affectionately known as the Gus, the Ultrasound was introduced to the market in late 1992 by Advanced Gravis Computer Technology at a listed price of $199.95. And no, the name has nothing to do with diagnostic sonography and everything to do with providing MS-DOS and Windows 3.1 based computers with ultra levels of sound capability. Specifically, the Gravis Ultrasound is a sound card that not only provides up to 16-bit 44.1 kHz stereo sound and mixes up to 32 sound channels, but it does so using some impressive sample-based music synthesis commonly known as wavetable synthesis. In other words, instead of music and games sounding like this... You could have music that sounded like this. Not only that, but in some situations, the Gus was a cheaper option than similarly specced competitors, making it an appealing upgrade option for a time. However, its reputation as a reasonably priced wavetable sound card is absolutely not the case decades later, with classic sound blasters remaining relatively cheap and a loose ultrasound commonly selling for anywhere from two to four hundred dollars at the time of this recording. As such, I owe a massive thank you to those of you who donated all the Gravis products you'll be seeing throughout this video. I've been wanting to make this episode ever since I started LGR, so truly, thank you. This would not have happened without your generosity. That being said, there must be a reason for the ultrasound's continually rising price tag and avid fan base, so let's dive into the history of the card, unbox this original Gus Classic, and set it up with the LGR Woodgrain 46 and see how it performs. Advanced Gravis Computer Technology was a Canadian company formed in 1982 based in Burnaby, British Columbia. And throughout their first decade on the market, computer peripherals were their bread and butter, largely consisting of input devices for the Apple II, Macintosh, and IBM PC-compatible machines. Things like the Advanced Gravis Joystick, the Advanced Gravis Super Mouse, and a fascinating combination device, the Gravis Mouse Stick. But their real claim to fame, and the first time I heard of Gravis personally, was the legendary Gravis GamePad. Introduced in 1991 for the Macintosh, Amiga, Atari ST, and PC platforms, the four-button gamepad was a godsend for computer gamers who wanted a console-like controller to go with the increasing number of console-like computer games, especially platformers like Prince of Persia, Commander Keen, Zool, and Jazz Jackrabbit. Not to mention the growing popularity of fighters like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter II, which were even more ideal with a controller. And with the Gravis GamePad being such an early console-style gamepad for home computer systems, it sold like crazy, making Gravis the world's largest producer of PC game controllers for a time. But 91 was a huge year for Gravis for another reason, and that was the Gravis Ultrasound. Stepping into the limelight with a press release from the 1991 Fall Comdex show in Las Vegas, claiming that it was the ultimate all-digital sound solution for IBM PCs. Gravis Ultrasound matches or exceeds all other PC sound products. After several delays and lots of hype, it finally hit the Canadian market in October of 1992, with the US and elsewhere following in the coming months. It was met with its fair share of praise, largely due to its hardware-driven wavetable synthesis, outputting at frequencies up to 44 kilohertz. And with many sound card owners upgrading from ad-lib and sound blaster cards that could only play FM synthesized music with far fewer instrument channels, moving to the Gravis Ultrasound for just under $200 was an easy sell. In fact, the Gus could be downright affordable by comparison. For instance, the Sound Blaster 16 was $349 when it launched in 1992, and that didn't even have dedicated wavetable synthesis. For that, you needed to buy an additional daughterboard upgrade. And then by June of 1994, the wavetable-focused AW32 was $265, with the original Gravis Ultrasound having dropped to $129 by then. 
Hardware reviewers directed some well-earned praise towards the Gus, pointing out how impressive its 32 voice wavetable audio could be, but also pointing out drawbacks like a lack of games designed to take advantage of it in its first couple years on the market. There was also its subpar Sound Blaster and FM synth support, making compatibility with existing PC games a chore due to it relying on a somewhat messy software emulation method to pull it off. Still, the ultrasound sold decently enough that game developers and Gravis continued to support the card, with around a couple hundred compatible games and multiple card revisions hitting the market over the next several years. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and take a closer look, starting with this Gravis Ultrasound Classic. And man, is this a childhood dream come true. Just having one of these in my possession is honestly a bit surreal. First up, we get the card itself, a 16-bit ISA board with a pleasant bright red PCB. I love crimson colored boards, though it seems like it was mostly ATI and Gravis that went with red back then. Guess it's a Canadian thing. Next is a plastic package filled with all sorts of paperwork, including a Gravis product registration card, and this one being sold in the US it referred you to their distributor in Washington State. Next are a couple of ads for related products, like the Gravis Analog Pro and PC Gamepad, as well as games, adapters, and the Gus memory upgrade kits. Oh yeah, this was back when you could easily upgrade the RAM to your sound card, and it was awesome. Then you get several documentation booklets with hundreds of pages of instruction manual goodness covering everything from the setup of the card to using the included software to tweaking your PC in order to attain sound that is as ultra as possible. And while there were multiple bundles available over time, this one came with five high-density 3.5-inch floppy disks containing drivers, demos, MIDI patches, and programs for playing back and recording digital audio, including Ultrasound Studio 8. Mine also came with this additional package ordered from Gravis, containing the Gus Software Development Kit version 2.01. So whoever bought this originally had larger intentions than just gaming. Let's get back to the card itself and admire all those connectors, interfaces, and ports, oh my. From left to right we have dip sockets for RAM expansion, a 4-pin compact disc audio interface, and some lengthy headers for adding either a CD-ROM controller or a daughter board for stereo 16-bit recording. And at the heart of the Gus is a chip known as the GF1, designed in cooperation with Forte Technologies. It's based on an older Insonic chipset, the ES5506 Auto, most often used in the Insonic VFX line of synthesizers from the late 80s. Then on the I.O. panel you can see we have mic and audio inputs, a joystick slash MIDI interface, line out, and amplified out ports, as the previous owner so thoughtfully noted for us. Getting it installed is quite simple, and we'll be using the venerable LGR Woodgrain 46 running at 66 MHz for this one. Just gotta take out the Sound Blaster card I had installed, snap the Ultrasound Classic in its place, plug in some speakers, and we're ready to go with the software. I'll be using the 2.04 discs that it came with, which provides a helpful installation menu letting you choose which features of the nearly 17 megabytes of software you'd like to install. Uh. Or I tried to at least. Seems the floppy disk didn't quite agree. I was also sent this collection of 2.06 discs and well, those turned out to be even worse. DOS couldn't even get a directory reading. Thankfully there are plenty of archives online, so I wrote my own discs and all was well. After it's installed you'll reach the Gus setup utility to make sure everything's working, with a variety of features being adjusted through software instead of jumpers on the card itself. And if it's working, you'll hear plenty of bombastic sound effects. Finally, you're free to test out the software that it came with, including an incredibly basic mod player with various sample tracks, like this one from the Game Star Control 2. You can also test out some MIDI playback capabilities using the included MIDI player and sample files. It's also an example of the card's lack of hardware reverb and chorus effects, so you're not going to have the kind of room-filling wet MIDI renditions you'd get on, say, a Roland MT32 or a sound canvas. Finally, there's Ultrasound Studio, an incredibly simple and rather clunky audio recording and editing program. Still, I would have found this plenty impressive in 1992, with the ability to quickly record, cut, and mix audio clips together. 
This is a test of the Gravis Ultrasound Classics microphone recording capability. This is a test of the Gravis Ultrasound Classics microphone recording capability. But that's enough of that. Let's check out some games. And for me, there was no question. The first game I had to try was Jazz Jackrabbit, the very title that introduced me to the Gravis Ultrasound's existence in the first place. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me, but that sounds better than I've ever heard. Like that right there? Wow. <laughs> Yum. I didn't think I'd be able to hear the difference, but good grief, that sounds good. Yum. Holy crap. Yeah, that was my legit first reaction. I was seriously awestruck by how good this sounded, having come from the Sound Blaster Pro 2.0. It may not come across well depending on YouTube audio compression and your sound setup, but just listen to these side by side. Here's another title that makes great use of the card, Epic Pinball, and well, just listen to this awesomeness. Dude, those samples are so crispy, and it actually plays more consistently than my SB Pro. And that's another Gus Plus. With games programmed to take advantage of it, they'll not only receive high quality sound, but you might also get improved performance due to how things can be mixed on the card itself without taxing your CPU. As an example, playing Descent on this 486 machine with my Sound Blaster Pro results in the music irritatingly speeding up and slowing down. But with an ultrasound? Nah, man, the music continues playing in a more constant tempo regardless of frame rate. The thing is, while this makes the Gus a solid choice on lower-end hardware, it is unfortunately a real toss-up as to whether or not the game you want to play fully supports it. While hundreds of titles claimed to have Gravis Ultrasound support, what that actually means can vary quite a bit from game to game. Sometimes you get improved performance and great sound quality when a game has a sound mode specifically built for the Gus, but other times it's just wrapping up a general MIDI implementation and mixing audio using your CPU like any old random sound card. Also, it's worth mentioning that while the Gus Classic is capable of 44 kHz stereo sound, it can only output 14 of its possible 32 channels at that rate. With the maximum number of channels playing back at once, the quality drops to just 19 kHz, so that's something to keep in mind when working with more involved music. Keeping on the topic of tunes, you might see the program Ultra Mid come into play with various games. Now, this program is sometimes required and often comes with games that rely on MIDI playback and use the Miles audio interface libraries. How well this works depends on how the game loads instruments, how many it uses at once, how much conventional memory you have, how much RAM your ultrasound has, etc. But typically when you see something using Ultra Mid, I found that results weren't exactly optimal, especially on the original Ultrasound Classic with the factory installed 256K RAM on board. Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, you can take advantage of MIDI in and out using something like the Gravis Ultrasound Universal MIDI Connector Box. While the Gus doesn't provide MPU-401 compatibility through hardware, there are some software solutions like MegaM to achieve this. Not only that, but this program also allows you to emulate Roland hardware through software, loading in samples mimicking the sound of those devices. Although, good grief, the headaches I went through to get this working were all for naught, especially on this 2.4 revision of the unexpanded Gus Classic. It not only doesn't have enough RAM to emulate anything close to a full version of General MIDI, but again, there are no reverb or chorus effects built in, and it won't load all the custom Roland patches and parameters for all games anyway. Speaking of lackluster emulation, Mega M, as well as another Gravis program called SBOS, can attempt to emulate the features of a Sound Blaster. 
This was Gravis's way of getting around the card's lack of OPL synthesizer chip or Sound Blaster compatible DAC, and provide some semblance of compatibility for games that don't support the ultrasound. And while the digital audio emulation is actually pretty good, the AdLib FM synth portion really, really sucks. That is just sad. I mean, they tried. It's better than no sound at all, I suppose, but wow, it makes ad-lib music sound like an ice cream truck. Just listen to Duke Nukem 2 here. But all of these positives and negatives so far have mostly revolved around commercial software, and the appeal of the Gravis Ultrasound reached another, far less mainstream audience as well. The demo scene. In case you're not aware, the demo scene subculture is one where programmers, artists, and musicians work together and compete to produce impressive software demonstrations, often pushing the hardware beyond what had been seen before. And much like the Commodore Amiga computers, the Gus became popular among demo sceners for its ability to play dozens of custom, simultaneous sound samples without over-reliance on the computer's CPU, leading to more impressive audio while freeing up resources for intensive graphical effects. And this was extra impressive considering Gravis initially hadn't published any detailed hardware references for the card, but in 1992 the Gus was reverse-engineered by Thomas Patel and Joshua Jensen, members of the group Renaissance known as Tran and Cyber Strike, two of the most fantastically 90s handles ever, once the nitty-gritty details were freely released through a text file known as Gravis Ultrasound Tech Specs The Unofficial Docs, the floodgates were open, whether Gravis wanted it or not. After the unofficial docs spread, plenty of demos, intros, and software was developed to take advantage, including a boom in tracker software like Gus Mod, Fast Tracker 2, and Impulse Tracker. Gravis eventually embraced this themselves, releasing their own programming guides and even partnering with demo sceners to create Gravis demos to display at trade shows and such. Gravis then continued to update their lineup with multiple revisions and new cards over the years, with the first major one being the Ultrasound Max in 1994, which doubled the included RAM to 512K, added multiple CD-ROM interfaces, and a Crystal Semiconductor 4231. No need for a daughter board anymore, now you just had 16-bit recording out of the box and support for the Windows Sound System standard and improving Sound Blaster emulation. Next was the Gravis Ultrasound Ace, or Audio Card Enhancer, in 1995. A cut-down version of the Gus Classic with no game port or recording ability, but the idea was to provide something similar to the Creative Wave Blaster daughter board, but on a standalone ISA card you'd install alongside another sound card of your choice so you could have Gus Wavetable Synthesis on top. A neat idea, and something you'll probably be seeing on LGR again. Another major update was the Ultrasound Plug and Play in 1995, which is a total overhaul of the Gus based on the AMD Interwave chip to provide 44 kHz playback at all times, 1 MB of sample ROM, and the ability to address 16 MB of RAM. Unfortunately, as awesome and enjoyable as each iteration of the Gus can be, Gravis really couldn't catch a break when going up against the might of Creative Labs. The Ultrasound might have been a cheaper option for a time, but Sound Blasters continually dominated in terms of overall game support, advertising, and heavy-handed business moves that left companies like Advanced Gravis Technology in the dust. By the time the Ultrasound had enough game support to make it more worthwhile to a larger number of PC users, plenty of other wavetable sound cards and daughterboard upgrades had hit the market at competitive prices and with hardware support for the Sound Blaster. In one final course correction, Gravis produced the Ultrasound Extreme cards in 1996. It combined the Ultrasound Classic with an ESS Audio Drive chipset to finally provide hardware Sound Blaster support on top of wavetable goodness, but it was too little, too late. 
Gravis discontinued the ultrasound line and started fielding acquisition offers, leading to them being bought outright by Kensington Technology in January of 1997, falling back to selling input devices under the Gravis brand into the mid-2000s before bowing out of the market completely. However, while it was abandoned by the company decades ago, the Gus has been kept alive by fans ever since. With multiple attempts at software emulation through emulators like DOSBox, and more recently a Gus-compatible card known as the Argus in development by a bunch of people on Vogons. And I can see why. I was always a bit mystified by these cards before doing this video, but now I think I really get it. For 1992, what the Gravis Ultrasound was pulling off with such high-quality sample-based playback, it honestly took me by surprise. It's a shame that they couldn't hold on to that little bit of an early start because, man, the ability to load custom samples into its RAM is super versatile, and the output is just so clean. Clean in more ways than one, not just in terms of clarity. I experienced very little line-level noise coming out of it, say, compared to my Soundblaster Pro 2.0, 16, or even the R32. At the same time, though, the reality is that the Gus is a card with less than 200 games that natively support what it can do, making it the less reasonable choice considering there are thousands of Sound Blaster-focused titles. It is at least enough for me to want to keep these cards around and continue to mess with them for no doubt years to come, and that is absolutely what I'm going to be doing. So if you enjoyed this video, perhaps you'd like to stick around. I am sure that this is not the last time the Gravis Ultrasound of some kind is going to appear on LGR. And once again, I want to thank those who donated all these devices, as well as Mr. Jim Leonard and Charles Sheffield for providing all sorts of really useful information on first-hand experience with the demo scene and technical specs and all sorts of things from back in in the day. There really is a wealth of information about the ultrasounds out there, which is a testament to how uniquely enjoyable they can be. But anyway, that's enough for this time, and as always, thank you very much for watching.